Okay, so why do we need forecasting? Well, my one of my greatest mentors when I started in finance many years ago told me the most important thing in hotel finance is understanding the revenue. If you understand the revenue and you control the revenue, you can control the costs more easily. So why forecasting? Well, first of all, any budget is probably out of date by the time you actually get it authorized these days. So, so they're, they're good as a target, but they're not that good at actually giving you the, get, driving your business um, on a day-to-day -day basis. If a budget's too strict, then you're, the team are running after it all the time. They get demotivated and, and you lose that control over, over, over the impetus. And then if it's too easy, then you just loot, you're demoralizing your staff all the time. So I always assimilate the budget to a roadmap. You go on a journey and you look at your roadmap when you start your journey. You say, I want to get to there, I'm going to use this route. But during the journey, you will have accidents, uh, works, all different things. You may even get lost. And so that's why you rely on the GPS to keep you on, the, on track of where you want to go. And for me, the forecast is the same thing. It helps you keep on track to your final destination um, as, as you're going through the year. Um, it also obviously helps you control your costs. These days, you can't wait till the end of a month to see what your costs were. You have to be controlling them on a day-to-day -day basis, especially payroll, food costs, these big, big hefty um, costs in your business that actually are guided by the revenue. You need to be able to control them regularly. So forecasting for me is like a circle. You, you do a forecast, you, you see how it goes, you learn from it, you do a better forecast, and eventually you get better and better at the whole process. When to forecast? Well, normally I always used to forecast every two weeks for the next this month and the next month ahead and have a rough idea for the three months further, just so that I could control cash flow, et cetera. But in these stark times, it's probably every day and every week that you're actually looking at a forecast, seeing where things are going and, and modeling it to try and get a better idea of where your costs need to go day by day. Um, but whatever you do, always make sure you encourage your team to participate in the forecast because that way they'll buy into it and you'll get more, more, more motivation from them to actually achieve that budget. So um, also if you're forecasting, it's better to do it day by day because some, some companies, they do it just a month at a time. Well, if you're forecasting um, one particular month once a year, you're not really going to get good at it. Whereas if you're forecasting particular days of the week constantly, you will slowly get better and better at that process and you'll be able to tie down much better the whole, the, your whole forecast. And also, if you just do a month and then divide it by 30, then all you'll have is 30 differences. Whereas if you start to forecast day by day, slowly your debt, you'll get better and better at it. And there will be one or two days that actually give you a difference. And they're the days you need to concentrate on. Was it, what happened that day? Was it, was it an extra event you hadn't forecast for? Did it rain and you didn't get that many clients in? What happened to make that? And how can you make sure that next time that happens, you can improve your business or you can, you can deal with it, yeah? To make sure that you're always maximizing your revenue options. So, so also if, if you've got bank holidays, for example, if you've got a weekend, an extra weekend in a month, that totally changes your month's forecast because you may have good weekends. If you're not doing a forecast day by day, you might miss that and you, and you might throw out what you're expecting to forecast for a particular month. But as you go, you sort of, you, you, and you keep forecasting and keep forecasting, you'll hopefully get better and better at it. So obviously, like I said, the main point for me of forecasting on a daily basis is that then you can push that into some kind of payroll system to know exactly how many staff you need each day, how much cost you're generating each day. It, it's a good idea in these payroll systems. You you have you you know what your 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 sales are every day. If you see your overspending at the beginning of a week, you've got that possibility to pull it back by perhaps reducing a waiter at the end of a month at the end of a week or whatever. But if you don't actually have clear idea of where your sales are on a day-to-day -day basis, it's not as easy to do that. 
So um, forecasts, I always for link my forecasts to my daily revenue report. And I always set a column at the end of a, at the end of a month of what I forecast at the beginning of a month. That way, it's usually what you've promised to the owners or the chief executives, and it gives you a clear idea of where you're going. So you have an, a, like a, a estimation of where you're going to be at the end of a month and you have your goal, which may not be the same as budget because it may be better or may be worse, it may not be the same as last year, but it's probably something which your team will, will eagerly work towards because it's something they got involved in and it's something which is more up to date. So, um, Oh, cool. just a minute. Uh, so make sure that you, you have some way of comparing easily your forecast with, with, what, with your daily results. I usually use red and green just to, just to help with that. Um, and always, like I say, make sure that your team buy into these forecasts. I quite often will adjust my forecast on a day to be slightly more accessible make a song and dance of it when they actually achieve that, that forecast. And that way, they'll be more in treat, the staff will be more in, in, in line to actually try and achieve that forecast every day or because they can see something good coming from it. So obviously when you're building the forecast, you can't just pluck a figure out of the air and say, oh, I think I'll have an occupancy of 50 next week. You have to base your forecast forecast on solid results. I always find a PMS system will have some way of pulling out the on the books figures but in an Excel format and there are simple formulas that you can then add those on the books figures into whatever format of a forecast you have um, and always have on the books plus your pickup. I usually copy a, the, the, the previous on the book figures up at the top of my forecast so I can have an idea of what the room pickup has been over the, next, the last week or two weeks, just to give me an idea of how the business is going as well. Some people have complicated revenue systems, um, but if you haven't got that, that level of technology, then, then it's an easy way of at least tracking how your pickup is going. And always make sure that your pickup average rate is what is in line with what you're selling at um, for that sort of period, because it, you may have a lower rate on your books because you've sold in advance and now you're selling at a higher rate and it gives you a, a better idea of where your revenue is going to come to. Um, so like I say, keep trying at the, at the forecasting, keep revising your forecasting because as you do that, you'll get better and better at it and that way you'll, you'll have a much, much better idea of how your business is going and you'll be able to plan more easily and you'll be able to introduce more actions to try and rectify what you're expecting. Um, when it comes to F&B, always make sure you use KPIs. Um, so you'll, you can, you can add, uh, estimate how many sleepers you'll have from the rooms you're expecting, or you should know your F&B capture rates. You should have an idea of how many residents you have each day, of a, how many non-residents you have each day of a week. And you should have an idea of your average spends, food and drink. And you put that together in, in, in in your forecast and it'll give you a much stronger idea of where you are expecting to be on each, each day of the week and in, in each area of your business. So um, give, a forecast gives you greater comparison to, to identify gains and losses. Um, and also it gives you, you can also even possibly flex it by the market segment. I, in some businesses, based on whether it's conference business, leisure business, or corporate business, I've been able to flex the number of guests I'm expecting to come down to dinner, coming to breakfast. So, so it depends how, how much information you have as to how complex you can make your forecast. But more importantly, you need to study those differences, figure out why things changed, and that's why you need more detail in your statistics. It might be that the reason you, you, you were low that day is because you had less diners from your residents. Why did you have less resident diners? Or you had less outside diners? Was it because it was raining? And those will give you an idea of, of for future of how to, how to try and adjust your forecast to bear those things in mind or, or how to do promotions to try and improve uh, those days. 
And if you don't have that data, it's a case of starting now because, because the sooner you start to collect the data on the KPIs, the number of covers, the number of non-resident covers, the number of spa treatments you do, all this information, the sooner you start to, to collect it, the sooner you can start to build more reliable budgets and forecasts. And obviously your forecast now, as you go forward, will help to bring, build a better budget for the future because you'll be, you'll be building on more solid ground. So always very important. So I've, I said before, revenue reports. Why have the daily revenue report? Well, before I mentioned about having the, the GPS, but the GPS works on the scenario, you know where you are when, you, when it, it tells you where you need to go. That's what the daily report is really for me. It's something that tells me where I am to help me guide to where I'm going. So why do we use a daily report? We use it to inform our team about what the business has been, where we've had successes, where we've had failures. It also uses it to plan ahead. If we know moving forward, we've got gaps in our business, we can try to do promotions to, to stimulate that those and fill those gaps. Or we can plan our payroll to make sure we don't overspend on those periods of time. Uh, and finally, we can use it to motivate. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with telling when the staff achieve their forecast, telling them, yes, we've done it, congratulations, having a celebration, having having an extra pudding on a better pudding on a staff canteen, simple things like that. But it just helps to motivate the team to know that there's something good about getting forecast. What format should a report take? Well, in my time, I've seen all sorts. I've seen very basic sort of three liners of a couple of figures. I've seen fancy ones where you have graphs and pie charts and this and the other. And it almost helps. It's it's almost so colorful that you don't actually realize what's going on. And then there's the odd, the odd one I've seen where literally that's a Bible of 15 pages and nobody ever gets past the first page anyway. So, so I always tend to stick to two pages, a brief outlining page and then a more detailed page that the management will want to look into in more detail. And on my front page, I will always make sure I have the, the, the top where I have the the big headline figures, food, drink, leisure, um, the key statistics for occupancy. Uh, and, and then going down, going down, uh, sorry, sorry. So the main important thing, like I say, is the daily figures. So always make sure you have that area of identifying what is good and what is bad. Like I say, I use red and green. And that means that even the most enumerate members of your team can see exactly how you did yesterday. And that will help when you can go into an, when you can sort of say to them, well, how did we do yesterday? They can feel as though they're actually part of it and they can actually, you know, they can actually know what the figures are talking about. Yeah, always make sure that you include figures like the REVPAR, the ADR, the occupancy, uh, TREVPAR, but always make sure that your team know what those figures are about, what they, what they mean, yeah? And include last year and budget, obviously, because they're as important, but, it, some, but I always say the most important thing is always your forecast. And across the page on my, on my revenue reports, I always make sure I have a week to date. Some people say they have like the, the seven days of the week, as far as I'm concerned, the most important is where we are to date this week. So I have a week to date figure and I will always guide that figure on last week's days. So it's no use comparing a Sunday with a Monday. Um, so I will always make sure that on the last week figures, I, I have the last physical week of Monday to Sunday compared to this Monday to Sunday. So I have a clear idea of, of where it was. And again, I'll have month to date figures for the actuals for last year. And often what I do is I put in a figure that says, how much do I need to get to get to budget? Because it kind of puts an, another, another, another look outlook on things. You know, if you're, if you're making 3000 a day and it says you've got to make 4000 a day to make budget, then it's a simulation. If it says you've got to only make 2000 a day, then you think, oh, we're going in the right direction. We're, we're already ahead. And most importantly, like I say, always make sure you've got your 
outlook for the end of a month. You've got your forecasted outlook with your actuals included, the forecast of where you said you'd be at the beginning of the month last year and budget. And then always make sure you break down the, your F&B areas into, into the different departments and the meal periods. You may not have a team which you can sort of divide and say, this is the restaurant team, this is the bar team. But if they know where the business has gone and where, where it's been good and where it's been bad, it'll help them to have a better idea of, of where to focus on in future days. It always make sure that subtotals are clear so that everybody can, everybody can understand the report. And, and on the second page, like I said, I put more detail. And, what, and that's not hard to do if you're collecting the statistics because you can put in your, your capture rates, your average spends on food and drink. You can put in your average spends on, on treatments. And, and all this information will help to figure out where things went right and where things went wrong. And by doing that will help you not only to guide your business and your promotions, but also help you to forecast better as you move forward. And slowly you'll, you'll get better and better at the forecasts. And finally, doing all that will help you to increase sales and obviously increase profit. So how do you achieve a good report? Well, the main thing to get a good report and get a quick report is to have all the information in one file. It may, takes time to set up to start with. I used to use a 365 day forecast and I set it all up at the beginning of the year with a budget last year, et cetera. But it, then it means that on a daily basis, a lot quicker to, to pull those figures. And if, if you've got a good PMS system, you can pull a trial balance off that PMS system that tells you what, what you've done each day and you can link that with the, the cells in your report. So nobody is manually entering any figures. The worst thing I find is it's somebody puts in a wrong figure while they're building the report. Everybody thinks it's a good day or a bad day, and then we find out that actually somebody's made an error. So as much as you can automate it, and the same with the covers, most PMS uh, EPOS systems will allow you to record covers, but it's usually just the covers. I always make sure that they have a log of resident covers, non-resident covers, and if necessary, conference covers. Because that, and I, I get them to put it into a simple Excel sheet that I can just paste in the report on a daily basis. But that means that I'm getting much more information about who's actually in my restaurants, who's actually in my bars, who's coming down to breakfast, et cetera, who's coming out from outside for breakfast or dinner. And, and if you've got a booking system, usually they, you, can, you can work out ways of doing this. So if you have walk-ins, you always make sure you mark that they're either the residents or non-residents, and you just make sure if everybody who's in the restaurant has gone through your booking system, and you can mark it easily at the end of the shift and just make a summary and say, right, so many, so many, so many, and that's it. But as you as people grow the, 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 the covers, they'll start to understand it better. I mean, I've, I, the number of times I've seen the num 22 covers order two main courses in, from a POS system, quite strange really but, it, but it, it, that 22 instead of two will throw out all your figures so unfortunately I haven't bit found a system which records covers better than your own team and if they're built bought into the whole forecasting process they'll want to make sure those figures are recorded correctly and more than anything check that it all makes sense I mean if you have an average spend on breakfast of 125 pounds you know something's not quite right won't you but make sure your team are checking those on a daily basis. And who do, you, you, who do I usually get to do the report? Well, I usually get reception to do it because they're there seven days a week, so they can do it every day to make sure that figure comes out. Um, they often are more numerical than possibly other, other operational members of staff. Um, you don't have to have people in the office doing that job. They know when they've run the day end, so they know when they can do the report. And it also increases their awareness of the business. And as they increase their awareness of the business, they'll learn where the anomalies are, are within the business. And they'll look at it and say, well, that looks wrong. And if it is wrong, or as in the business was bad that day, they'll learn to be able to say, oh, actually, because we had a bad day, because this, this, and the other. And you will develop those, those, those people into real revenue managers, as it were, because they'll start to understand the business and they'll, 
and they'll like, start to understand how their part of the business can help to in increase the rest of it, how they can recommend the restaurant, how them recommending spa treatments can actually increase the business. And so it all comes around to it. I always make sure when I send out my reports, I send out a copy and PDF so the managers can read it easily. Nothing worse than getting a, uh, an Excel document on your mobile and trying to figure out what, the, what it says. And, and if you've got a PDF, even the, the people who have not got good sight can always blow it up nice and nice and big and actually see the figures. So, so I always make sure there's a PDF goes out to the managers. And then to the, I always make sure there's a copy printed and put on the back uh, in the notice board, a back of house, because that way the whole team is part of the process. The whole team understands where you've gone. And that way you can walk into the kitchen and say, guys, how did we do yesterday? You can turn around to kitchen porter. Did we have a good day in the restaurant? And because it's red green, they'll be able to say, well, well, yes, it was a good day because it was green. You know, it, 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 it makes sure they're all bought into the process and they can all start to think about how their little grain of sand builds the whole castle. Yeah, so, so basically that's, that's my take on forecasting and revenue. I hope you've uh, you found something interesting, something useful. And if there's anybody got any questions, then please fire fire away. Anybody? Sorry, um, we do have a question from Julian. Uh, Julian, mm -hmm. do you want to read your question out, or or, or are you? Uh, yeah, sure. I'm happy to do so. So, Robin, I was just I mean, forecasting is clearly a skill, without a doubt. Um, and, 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 you know, the, even taking that all the way back to daily budgeting, which which not many places do, but there's a, there's a, a huge, hugely positive reason for doing it, because it helps in that forecasting piece. Um, but there are going to be properties uh, that are going to have lost financial controllers. Um, there are going to be properties which need closer uh, financial management. Um, is there scope to move to an offsite service? Is there scope to to um, kind of yeah. you know, bring in third parties like you? And 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 how would how would that work? Well, yeah, the I skills mean, aren't in house. I mean, I don't want to promote myself too much, but I mean, the whole my whole the whole ethos behind the way I work is when I've worked in individual units, I've probably spent about sixty percent of my time doing admin work. So they've paid a high level wage for somebody to just do admin. Whereas the philosophy behind Hotel Synergies is, is that I do the tricky work. I, in, I implement forecasting documents, get people trained to use them, re daily reports, implement the cost control systems. And then I get them to do all the admin work. And, 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 and that needs to be the way forward with sort of smaller units. They, 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 don't, they, they don't need somebody on it. They either have an accountant who actually doesn't give them much support or they have an expensive financial controller who, who probably is spending half their time doing admin work. And it's not just, and, and I've said this for a long time, it's not just financial control, it's the sales managers as well. You can have some very good off-site sales managers who, will, who are very professional and very skilled who you wouldn't be able to afford as an individual outlet. However, employing them on, on an off-site short-term sort of temp part-time basis as it were where they do the intricate stuff and give give the admin staff in the hotel the the more the more basic work to do it, it it's cost effective and it probably brings a better a better skill and quality to to the hotel that they wouldn't normally have thought about thank you thanks, thanks robin we also had another question from uh, rose uh, which is a good question. Um, Robin, what's your advice in forecasting short and medium term as in certainty when things will get back to normal? 2022 inquiries are down, for example. So what do you think about short and medium term? It's, it's a bit of a piece of string question, isn't it? It is a bit of a piece of string question. Uh, but like I say, I mean, this is why I do a day-to-day -day forecast uh, because I bung in the OTB figures. I, I'm looking at them constantly and so, and I, and everything else rotates around those OTB figures. So, so the, although it's hard to set up to start with and you, and, and you need to collect all that information, once you get it going, it does kind of give you an automatic idea of where you're going to be 
And, and if you're updating the OTB figures daily, then you can see your forecast adjusting automatically and you can see your pickups changed if you do what I say with like copying the, the previous times and, and, and all that's kind of helps you to actually get a better idea of where your business is going and where it's flowing and, and what's changing. And so it, I find it a lot easier to do that than just trying to, to sort of estimate what might be happening in the future. I'm a, I'm a bit of a detailist as it were, but I find the detail helps to make it much easier to, to, to sort of to read the crystal ball for the future. On that, on that point, um, could you and, and Julian uh, elaborate how your forecasting interrelates into what Julian was talking about last week in terms of a dynamic business planning? Well, yeah, it, it's the, the whole point of a forecast, if it's done well, it is dynamic. So, so you're, you're constantly looking ahead. And, and like I say, I mean, I have a 365 forecast and I'll bung in the on the books figures for the whole year and I'll be, look, and I'll be looking ahead and I might be saying, oh, there's something, something strange in the future. We need to, perhaps we need to, perhaps we need to put a, a cap on, uh, make it a two, two night stay minimum or something like that, just to make sure that one weekend you don't end up with, with um, a Friday that's empty and the Saturday that's full and all that sort of thing. So, so by doing this sort of regular forecasting, it is I, I consider it to be a dynamic process of constantly looking at how your business is changing, where it's going and also looking at where your shortfalls are. And as you see where your holes are, you start to do other things to try and motivate business for those times. I think, I think that's amazing. Julie, Julian, do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we were saying last time about that, that scenario planning. So, you know, your plan A, plan B, plan C, and, and okay, there's some notepad and pen work that goes on to figure out what all those scenarios are. Um, but once those scenarios are built, popping them into that forecast sheet really starts to bring it to life. Um, and and then, then you start to bring in other skill sets and, you know, picking up on that. Do we need to do a promotion that weekend? Do we need to restrict stays? Do we need to do that? Uh, all of those technical things that come in, that's where you start to bring in the other parties that, that will influence that. And, and I know that we've got uh, Sarah speaking on, on revenue management in a, in, a, in a short while, a few weeks as well. And so it's that you, you start to flag up those holes. Where are those holes? Right. Who do we need? What do we need? Where's the skill sets to, to have a damn good go at plugging those gaps? Yeah, thank you. Can I just ask, um, what's your advice on um, <clears throat> working out pickup at the moment? Um, I'm working with a venue and we're, we're looking at scenarios and things like that, but it's just, it's hard. So yes, you can forecast each day if things change and keep an eye on all of that, but it's using historical information before over the past few years we've got a really good idea of what we're going to pick up and so it'd be really helpful if if I, I think the way the way I look at it as yeah you can look at sort of last year's historical but you can't now no. and, and you can't even look at 2019 because we may not be there but if you're looking at it on a regular basis your historical is last week you're, you're, no, it, it gets to that stage of things where if you're regularly looking at your forecast, you're regularly checking your OTB and how much you've picked up. And you're saying, wow, that weekend suddenly picked up, that, that, this, this, this day is suddenly picked up. It's much easier to actually start to think, well, I can see a trend here. You know, I can see that actually these, it's growing quicker than I expected or it's growing slower than I expected. And that's the, that's the beauty of, of, these, of these forecasts is that you're actually when you're in this situation where you don't, you, you have very, very, very little clue of yes. how life is <laughs> to go on. It, it, it's, it's a case of actually putting structure into that, into that process where you're actually basing your ideas on something physical, even if it's only literally what, what's happened since last week. You know, it, it, it's, that, it's that sort of basic and yeah. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, uh, thanks Robin. Brilliant questions. Uh, just to say thank you for those that joined us uh, after we'd started. Um, that was Robin from uh, Hotel Synergies. 
I think we need to move on because we're quite aware that uh, 11 o'clock we say we've finished and we've got another superstar performance coming through now from Claire from Venue Queen. who's going to talk to us about knowing your mark, knowing and understanding your market. She's got various hats on, so that's quite interesting. But again, obviously, if you've got further questions, you want to take it further, then please do speak to uh, obviously Robin, Claire, etc. Anybody around the screen later, we've got contact details so please do that it's just that we wanted to try and keep it to an hour unless we get paid any more then obviously we'll go into extra time that's absolutely fine so if we can move on to claire and her presentation if you don't mind claire can everybody see that i'm not technical so this bit sometimes goes wrong for me fantastic okay so um my name's claire and um i have two two hats really so venue queen is usually venue finding not a lot of that happening at the moment um and venue consultancy not a lot of that happening at the moment um and borrow my garden and that is going phenomenally well with the fact that um outdoor space is is perceived to be the best place to be at the moment um although obviously following tier guidelines Hold on a minute. So um, what we want to look at is um, knowing and understanding your marketplace. So we all know and understood our business inside out, back to front before March 2020. Since March 2020, we've all been trying to work out where we're sitting and how it how it's working. But we want to, to move forward. We need to understand where our business is coming from now. Who's looking at us now? What are people looking for? We need to be out there. And the best way of us being out there is on the internet because we're all sat there and we're all working from screens. So without a shadow of a doubt, everybody now is on social media, which is absolutely brilliant. We're all out there, we're posting, we're putting things out there, but are you looking at what that social media is doing? Are you looking at the analytics? Are you looking at the posts that are getting seen, the ones that, nobody's interested in and then looking at why there's certain posts that you put out that doesn't matter sort of what time you post it will get lots and lots of hits lots and lots of feedback there's others that you put out there that you don't get anything at all on I know on Venue Queen I could have posted um, all sorts of bits and pieces about venues and about where we'd been and then I could post one about our security dog being fast asleep in its basket and I'd get loads of hits. So uh, not really what I was looking for, but actually it helps with the traction. Everybody on your website should have Google Analytics set up. Um, Google Analytics, if you haven't got it set up, it's free to do. It's actually fairly simple and you don't need to understand all of it. There are key elements that you understand we are frequently looking at how many visitors we have, how many page views we have, where people are going. Is that linked into the social media campaigns that we've been doing? Is it totally irrelevant? Is it with something that's going on nationally? Is it something that's going on locally? What's happening? Um, it's absolutely vital that you learn and understand where your business is coming from. For me, the key element on Google Analytics is the referring sites, which sites are actually referring people to your website. And from that, we can then pick up where people are going to and what they're looking at. And that's what we need to understand. We need the new patterns. Everything is changed. We almost need to park what we did pre-March 2020 and look at it at the new business for what we're currently doing. And then look at your inquiries. What inquiries are coming in now? I mean, we look after a couple of venues and we are seeing the wedding inquiries coming in. Most of them are for 2022 or beyond, but some of them are, I just want to get married and I want to get married now. Um, so we all obviously need to follow the tier guidelines, but actually have you got information in place to send out on your micro weddings? We don't know what we're going to be allowed post the 22nd of February. He has said weddings can come back after Easter, but he hasn't said in what format. So if we look at what we've done previously, we have been allowed weddings of 15, we have been allowed weddings of 30. Have you got micro packages out there that people can pick up off your website, can see what you're doing? It's all about being visible and giving people what they want at the moment in bite-sized chunks. 
And then obviously we need to be looking at dates that we're going to be allowed to do things, but there's no harm provisionally holding bits and pieces for couples and talking to them. Have a look at your diary. What's your business on the books like? Are we going to be able to deliver that business on the books? Um, but the other diary you need to be looking at is what appointments have you got in? You still need to be out there. You still need to be seen. Now, we worked on a uh, mind map. So we've got our business, the hotel in the middle, and then we've got all the different segments that then come off that business. Again, what are we allowed to do within the tier that you're going to be in within all those segments and how do we get that out to the marketplace? Now, it could be that your restaurant, if we go back to the guidelines that we were on before, um, if you had a hundred seater restaurant, you're now only allowed to seat 30 people. So how do you make that up? Can you do takeaways? It's not about bums on seats. It's about pennies in the till. Can you, can you get that information out to people? Can you tell people that, you know, you can still come and you can still have your really nice dinner and actually you can take it away and you can have it at home if you don't want to eat in. There's no reason why everybody can't be doing that. We know we can't seat them in a restaurant. Your social events, your weddings, make sure you've got your micro weddings out there. Your meetings, we know if we go back to our being allowed to do what we were doing before, maximum 30. So have you looked at the hybrid option? What can you do? Have you got the information out there on your website saying what's safe to do? If you've got grounds, have you looked at what you can be doing in your grounds? Can you extend your restaurant to be pop-up restaurant outside as well? Some of these things you will need to make sure you've got the right licenses for. And speak to your council. The council are bending over backwards at the moment to try and make sure that your businesses work because they need to keep the economy going. But it's all about looking at your business. Imagine walking through your front door now for the first time. What can you offer that person that's walking through the door? What can you do here and now? That's what we need to be dealing with. We can keep in all the other bits and pieces that we could do at a later date, but here and now, what can we do? How many of you know what you pay a subscription for? Who are you paying to do what for you? And are you utilizing that? If you've got your Google Analytics set up, you can see on your website from your Google Analytics, which sites are actually coming to you. Who's bringing you business? If people are not saying on your website, once they get to it, that's a whole different ball game. But if you're paying somebody a subscription to get people to your website, they need to be doing so. And you can see that on Google Analytics, that's your proof. You should also be able to go back to your, whoever you're paying and they should be able to give you some analytics of what they're sending you as well. And you know, there, there should be some synergy there. Pick up the phone and speak to these people you're paying them, you're their customer. You could be working with them. You could be saying to them, what else can I be doing to make sure I get in front of your customers? What else do you need from me? Become a person, don't just become the business. People still need to know the face, know the voice. They need to know that you're there. Have a look around the internet. What are people looking at? Have a look at competitors. Where are you? Where do you sit? What else could you be doing? Why are you not at the top? Now, your website, is it up to date? Does it say what you can currently do now? Now, we're not saying that you shouldn't have pictures like this one and like this one that shows what you can do in a meeting room when it's full but actually we're not allowed to do that at the moment. So keep that up there because that will come back. But I want people want to see what they can do when they can do safely. They also want to see that you're, we're good to go from Visit England or from the AA or from the MIA or whoever it might be, it means you've been through the process to say, actually, we're absolutely safe for you to come to. You can feel totally safe because everything that we've been told we need to do, we've already got in place our policies and procedures and here they are, come and look at them. And this is how we're going to do that. It, it's all about making people feel safe in the environment that you're inviting them into. So 
you do need to have a COVID-19 section on your website or under your meetings and under your weddings, have your normal wedding package and then have your COVID-19, your micro meetings, your micro weddings. And then monitor what's coming through and what people are looking at. And hopefully as we come out of the pandemic, there'll be less micro meetings and weddings and more of the bigger meetings and weddings. But we all know we're a little way off that. So let's do baby steps. And what can we be doing here and now? We've had all sorts of inquiries come through over the last 10 months through Venue Queen and through Borough My Garden. Through Borough My Garden last summer, we actually had somebody ask to come off our site because they were getting too many inquiries and they couldn't handle them all. Um, absolutely flabbergasted, really, coming from a sales background, um, really. Um, we've also, um, we know of a venue that's been closed since March last year. And we've tried to give them inquiries and there is somebody there answering emails at the end of the phone, but every time we give them an inquiry, they just turn it down. But then we see they're on social media and they're saying, if you're you you know, if you're out there and you're not using us, then we're perhaps not gonna be here when this is all over. We really need you to be there. We're trying, we at least need you to listen to the inquiry. You might not be able to accommodate it and the event might not go ahead, but if you're getting an inquiry, it needs to be dealt with. Um, we also then get calls to say, we're only getting um, inquiries about our outside field and that's not what we normally do. Well, we're not in normal times, so we need to look at our business and what can we be doing now? We are speaking to a number of GMs, we are speaking to a number of people in a head of sales position that are now saying, the business that we would absolutely have turned down previously, we absolutely want now. So anything you've got will absolutely talk to you and will take anything. Those are the generally the venues that we go back to. Um, but so many people not answering the phone and not answering emails. It's all about your business on the books for you to survive when we come out of this. And once we go into different tiers, we will be allowed to deliver something. And that's what we've got to keep going on. So think outside the box, what can you offer that you wouldn't normally in any other circumstances offer? But actually, if you're sitting empty, you've got a perishable commodity. If you don't sell it once tonight, you can't sell it twice tomorrow. So what can you do? What can you offer? Look at your tiers. What are you allowed to do in the specific tier that you're in? And maybe you need to have a game plan for the different tiers so that as you go into different tiers, you know what you can offer you know what you can do and you can do safely. And some venues have stayed open. They've stayed open for takeaways and have allowed people to come in and walk around their gardens and buy a coffee or buy a piece of cake as long as they take it away. What else can you do to bring revenue through the door? We've had um, a panto theatre company, children's one, that want to tour around the UK and they want to do outside performances. And in some places they've gone to, um, they've gone in a farmer's field because they need to be outside. In venues that we've taken it to, actually it's gonna be working on a shared commission basis. So it's not worth a huge amount of money, but they're not allowed to be in picnics. They're not allowed to be in drinks. The minimum they can run with is 50 people. So you've now got the F and B for 50 people that you wouldn't have before. They are paying you a profit share. So look at it as a marketing exercise. They're doing all the marketing and they're actually paying you to do a marketing exercise for you. In normal circumstances, you probably wouldn't take it, but now absolutely, why would you not take that piece of business? Look at things differently. Everybody's pounds and pence needs to be coming our way if that's what they're looking for. And then how do we take it to market? And that's a whole new demographic of client. They're going to do the advertising for it. All you need to do is share it out on social media. If you can put it on your website, that's even better. And actually it shows you're then supporting the community and it's bringing a different sort of demographic into your grounds that potentially wouldn't have been there before. Hybrid events. So as a non-technical person and a person that's used to, have you got an LCD projector and screen? Um, hybrid events just fill me with a little bit of fear and don't really understand how it all works, which I imagine is how a lot of people in venues are feeling. But if you think of it is if it goes back and you're allowed to have 30 people in a, in a meeting room that's large enough to do it socially distance, 
you've then got a day delegate for 30 people. You can have the speakers and the facilitators on site with all the AV kit. And you could have, say, 970 people to bring your meeting up to 1,000 people, it being live streamed to. And you can get the commission of the hybrid company as well. So you're potentially going to get commission off 1,000 people, so a virtual day delegate rate. Sounds great. Um, but do you know what it looks like? How do you sell it in? You know if somebody's coming into your site, you're going to do a site visit with them. You're going to walk everything through where you're going to have lunch, where their main meeting room is going to be, where the green room is going to be, where the syndicate rooms are going to be. Potentially, you still have to do that, but you also need to be able to do that in a virtual way as well. So you need to understand how it works. Now, there is plenty of people out there offering the hybrid facility. There's plenty of AV companies out there offering that. So you need to make sure that with an AV company that you've got as a preferred supplier, you've also got hybrid event suppliers as preferred suppliers and that you understand how it works and what it looks like. So you can talk those people through it as well. It shouldn't be that scary. And once you've seen it, it tends to be less scary, but it is app based usually. Um, so that people can do polls and they can be interactive and they can move into different rooms. Um, we have seen it. It's not as scary as I originally thought it was to start with, um, but we have got a, a, a hybrid event company coming on next week for you, uh, two weeks time for you to see, explore as well. So it hopefully makes a little bit more sense. Now, who has outdoor space? If you have any form of outdoor space, we want to speak to you at Boromer Garden because we have all sorts of inquiries coming in for outdoor space. So yes, you can do your own picnic in the parks, you can do your own pop-up restaurants, but TP weddings and even small TP weddings for this year, outside space is still perceived to be safer than indoor space. Um, so if you can put a TP up, it might be a way of you earning sort of more weddings for this year in a different environment just consider it as a new revenue stream that you can put on your spreadsheet, Robin. Nice new line. Um, we've also been working with some external escape room experiences um, and, and they're looking to sort of partner up with venues. And again, it's on a profit share, but you get all the F&B out of it and they've done all the marketing for you. So we've got lots of different things coming through um, and we understand that staycations and campings probably isn't the right place for hotels. But it might be for other venues and it might be for um, farmers. Um, and we know of farmers last year in their field that would normally be doing weddings in huge marquees that started letting their fields per family so that they weren't having shared facilities with anybody. And all they got was a field and an outside toilet that was delivered each week. So people are wanting to stay safe and stay within their own group. Now, there's also plenty of people out there wanting to support venues. So Search for Venues are offering a free standard listing on their site. Who wouldn't take that up if you're not on there already? Um, I know Karen's on the call today. So Karen, I don't know if you want to put the contact details in the chat box about uh, who they're best to contact to sort of take you up on that offer. But the whole idea is that during this time, Karen can prove that her search platform is absolutely great and as we go on, you're going to want to enhance that listing. And so everybody's business grows. It's, it's a win-win for everybody. Cool Events Guide is another one that's offering a free listing on their website. And there are others, but have a look around and talk to people. Everybody out there that's, that's not within the venue wants to help the venue so we're all trying to do different bits and pieces to help everybody out it's all about collaborating and we are all stronger if we work together now our corporates and agents we all know are vital we all love them um but when was the last time you picked up the phone and spoke to them now we know there's a lot of corporates and we know there's a lot of agents that either are on furlough or not about but actually pick up the phone and speak to these people, drop them an email. I had the most randomest of email the other week about somebody saying they needed to go out and buy a new pair of jeans just on the basis they couldn't get the jeans on anymore. And it just made my day because rather than it being, well, I can't do this and I can't do that, 
actually it's just it's just normal chit chat that actually if I'd been on the phone to her I'd have had that conversation and it's and just about how we then move forward and she said I can't wait till we can get back to giving you inquiries and we can get back out there and going back to our live events and that's all it was about really is just keeping up that connection but the bit that you're probably not used to doing quite so much is working and looking at your local community what can you be doing for your local people and how do you get it out there there's obviously all those platforms on Facebook and Twitter and all those bits and pieces your local community tends to be the Facebook ones but speak to people speak to charities speak to everybody else if you can be doing something your community is going to be the first people back through your door probably not your corporates and your agents so much in your immediate it's definitely going to be that community your f and b the people wanting to do something for a special occasion so do embrace everybody that's there any questions uh that's great thank you there we do we do have a couple of questions actually i know time wise you know we're heading towards 11 o'clock which is fine uh, but one of the questions, let me just bring it up here, excuse me just a moment, it was basically about, um, uh, really interested in borrowing my garden. I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? You're sitting there now, who'd have thought a year ago you'd be looking at inquiries for, for fields and borderloos and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> um, but a question for you was, with hybrid and virtual, is this going to be a long-term service that venues need to consider as a revenue stream, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, if it's a, even if it's a smaller venue, so we look after a smallish venue in their, their restaurants, their largest room can seat 100. They obviously can't at the moment, but they could very easily do a hybrid in there for 30 people with the day delegate that can be streamed out to, let's say, a thousand people. So they get the DDR for 30 people and they then get the commission of that 970. Now, as that then gets bigger and you allow more people on site, probably it's not going to work in the smaller venues, but in a bigger venue, you start to bring more people on site and you have less people off site. So if you're a larger venue, you absolutely need to embrace those smaller, smaller meetings or the smaller people on site on the basis you're showing what you can do. You're supporting the smaller as they are at the moment. And as they can bring those thousand people back, you gradually have more people on site and less people off site which ultimately is more money in your pocket. Mm. So why do you think some venues aren't embracing the new, new, you know, not, not swiveling on their axis and pivoting and doing what they can do to get business? Because a lot of the independent venues we, you know, partner up with, they're fantastic. They're doing lots of stuff they would never have dreamed of a year ago. As you say, taking inquiries, offering a completely different service. So why do you think with your agency hat on or even borrow my garden that the venues will say, you know, computer says, no, we can't do that. Why, why is that? Well, I think it's the change. As humans, none of us like change and everybody is out of their comfort zone. And originally, last March, we all thought, I all thought, I thought this was, you know, might not have locked down three weeks, you know, maybe a month. OK, maybe two months, maybe three months. OK, really? Ten? Really? Um, but but it, uh, we've always said it's about your business on the books and it's about protecting your business. So that's why on the slides we said, walk through your hotel as you would walk through somewhere now and look at what you would expect and what we can deliver under the new guidelines and that's what you need to be doing so it's not scary it's a what can I deliver what can I give to that paying guest that's walking through the door now and then how do you make that work operationally no, that's a good answer and uh, we've just had a, a message from Nikki from Woodhaven a uh, great comment, Nikki, about, uh, you know, hybrid events have been their only real business for several months uh, last year. So obviously as a, a smaller independent venue, it's, it's a lifeline and also interested in borrowing my garden. And like I say, we've all had to change, you know, even us old folks have been in the business far too long. It's kind of, you've got to, you've got to do stuff, you know, it, it does take us up out of our comfort zones without a doubt. So yeah, that's great. Uh, okay. Uh, well, sorry, sorry, I've got one more question. Uh, that's, just right. coming to, that's just coming to me is uh, I, I know the question I know the answer but there's a question for my garden does this cover just England and based in England or does it cover properties venues fields whatever in Scotland and Wales as well yeah Scotland and Wales works so the whole of the UK is where we cover 
uh, and we get inquiries for all over and we often get inquiries for places where we don't have land um so we have to go looking mm. thank you claire thank you claire any other questions uh before we head up to 11 o'clock anybody else free to anything to do with claire or anything that maybe you'd like to see in the future just just for your diaries our next uh, event for the uh, affordable sales team is in two weeks time on the 11th of february i believe it's 2 p.m in the afternoon as opposed to the morning but we'll be we'll be i say we'll be it'll be that the intelligent people will put something onto eventbrite and send out invitations and we'll we'll obviously advertise that but can i thank you for those that have actually attended today it's really good to have you on board and we know times are tough but thank you again to robin and uh, obviously claire for their presentations but any more questions fire them at us now or uh, you're, you're very much free to uh, free to go as you will but thank you for joining us